Welcome back to Face the Nation, and we are back now with our chief legal correspondent, Jan Crawford. Jan, I want you to take something head on, which is this Democratic argument that if uh, that if this one FDA approved drug for abortion uh, is blocked, is that all drugs are somehow at risk. Is that true? I mean, I think that's a valid argument. If the if the courts are going to say lower the bar. Uh, and let people come into the federal courts to challenge things that were approved 23 years ago, uh, even if they haven't been harmed by the drug. I mean, it's hard. It's certainly an, a valid argument, and it could apply in other cases with other social issues. If the court lowers the bar in this case, mm -hmm. you're going to see conservative groups on other social issues going into the Supreme Court and saying, they have a right to sue here, too. You're going to embroil federal judges back into these social issue disputes, which, if we take the Supreme Court at its word, mm -hmm. is exactly what they said should not be happening. All right. Jen Crawford, I have to leave it there. Thank you for your time. And we turn now to New Mexico's Democratic governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham. It's good to have you back here in studio. Well, thank you, Margaret. I'm happy to be here. So your state is part of a 20-state coalition of uh, governors, the Reproductive Freedom Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, some of the states in it have started stockpiling this um, medication for abortion. When you were here in February, you said that's the wrong focus, the wrong question. Well, has that changed? No, it, it, for me, it hasn't changed. And we were, we, we're going to make sure, and we already are, that we have access to all of those medications. But if the response is, we'll stockpile instead of protecting all access, uh, then we're minimizing the work that we have to do to make sure that women and families are fully protected. Not that, in and of itself, there's a disagreement by state that's making sure that, irrespective of the legal decisions, we're going to make sure that medication abortion is available in our state. But I think that we are moving, uh, and to Jan's point, it's every social issue that you disagree with. Is it stem cell research? Is it fertility drugs? Whatever it is in this context, if we're going to use the federal courts as a way to bar and ban access, uh, we are looking at a national abortion ban and mm -hmm. more. And I think states have to band together to do as much as they can in opposition to that. And the states are on the front lines here because there is no federal guarantee. The court kicked it back to That's right. chief executives like yourself back in June. So currently in New Mexico, abortion is legal, but you don't actually have a law codifying it. I know you want to write one. We do. We do now. So the last time I was here, we didn't. And uh, you were, and thank you, talking about Colorado's uh, work. We now have a law both codifying uh, right to abortion, abortion care and access, as well as gender affirming care in the state. So that just got signed by me. Well, so nail down for me then, how do you define, because up, up till now, my understanding is there wasn't a limit on when in a pregnancy, a woman could receive an abortion. Have you set any limit on There are no limits. So for us, and that's very for controversial. Me, it can be. I mean, look, it's the 1% of all abortions, and uh, that's still a sizable number of abortions worldwide. 1% over 21 weeks of pregnancy. Correct. However, you know, look, these are women uh, that uh, have named these uh, uh, soon-to-be-born babies. These are horrific medical conditions. And again, New Mexico's position and mine is that we should not be interfering with a woman's right medical situation and her decision about that life-threatening potential circumstance. So we shouldn't be doing that. Explain that. How do you yeah. define fetal viability and, and or that line? So you say it's very, very uncommon, it, but... It is. It, that is not defined. It is left to two physicians make that decision with the patient. That's the issue, is that the government... Two physicians. Two physicians. Mm -hmm. And so the fear is that folks could take that to an extreme if someone has um, an affliction that isn't life-threatening. Well, of course. And that they're that picking is, and choosing which children they want to carry to term or not. Well, I find that argument not to be nearly as compelling as uh, the arguments that we make, that we should be focused on contraceptives and better maternal health care, which means you have better outcomes. It's the wrong side of the argument, and it pushes buttons for people's fears about what's really happening. Late-term abortions should uh, occur as rarely as humanly possible, mm -hmm. and they should be only for life-threatening conditions of the, of the fetus or the mother. And that should be analyzed by that physician. If we start making any access points, which we are all around the country, you end up with triggers and six weeks, fewer than six weeks. Uh, these are all barriers to women's health care. 
comprehensive reproductive health care. And New Mexico is going to stand with many other states to make sure that's not the direction we're headed in. So your state has become this um, haven of sorts for the surrounding states that do heavily restrict abortion, like Texas. Um, and Oklahoma. And Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm sure, part of your calculus here in, in crafting the laws you did. Um, but I wanted to come back to something you said, both in February and other remarks. You talked about using federal lands. Mm -hmm. You talked about talking to the tribes in your state. You have a mm -hmm. large um, uh, tribal population there. You said, we're moving towards tribal nations providing access, including abortion. The Hyde Amendment... Uh, Pre prevents federal dollars being used for abortion. But the sovereign White House land, not yeah, this. but sovereign land is a whole different designation of are federalism and federal land. We are doing it now, but I think we will, and I think we can. How? Well, a couple different ways. A sovereign nation makes its own decisions. Now, the question that I think you're asking is, would we use Medicaid to actually pay for those services? That is complicated with the Hyde Amendment. So the answer there is no. But we do a ton of state investments, and tribes have their own resources. They're already building behavioral health clinics. They run hospitals. Mm -hmm. They run primary care clinics. They're already in the business of delivering health care. And at least one of those tribes, a Pueblo in New Mexico uh, has certainly indicated that they would be more than ready, willing, able, and interested to make sure that access, because women of color have limited access mm -hmm. uh, for a number of reasons all over the country, and these are Pueblos who want to make sure that the, the women and families in their Pueblo or sovereign nation have equal access irrespective of distances that they might have to travel. Because last June, Vice President Harris was asked about this, and she said, no, the White House isn't looking at it. Are they looking at it, or is this just you? Well, I don't think the White House is looking at it, but they have heard loud and clear uh, from a variety of states, including New York, that every federal tool in the toolbox ought to be used to protect and expand access. New Mexico has an opportunity with 23 independent tribes to do that in a little different way. And so the point was, we won't leave any access point, right? on the table if it makes sense and yeah. we have willing partners. I want to quickly ask you about the water crisis. Um, there's this debate over the Colorado River, which appears to be drying up. It's been drought stricken for like two decades now. Um, do you need the Biden administration to step in here because the states aren't settling this? I think we themselves. do. And I think uh, having at least $4 billion, which is an incentive, look, uh, people aren't going to give up water rights and uh, automatically lean in to do conservation. It's hard mm -hmm. uh, and it's full of risk. The Biden administration, rightly so, got money available to create incentives so that we're doing better conservation and management. You've got six states working pretty well together. California, big water user, going to be tough. But uh, with good snowpacks, money, incentives, and cooperation, we're in the best place ever to do something meaningful about this. Governor, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good to have you back. And we'll be right back. We turn now to the Republican chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Ohio Congressman Mike Turner. Good to have you back. Thank you. Do you have any sense yet of the scale of the damage caused by the leak of this classified material by apparently this 21-year-old airman who has been arrested? Not completely, but clearly there's damage that's done. I mean, we have documents classified because we don't want them to get in the hands of our adversaries, and these have been widely circulated, so obviously these are, are, are damaging both the United States and to our allies. You know, what's troubling here is, you know, when you look at the documents that were circulated, that uh, you know, without, without a, the care of, of its handling, you know, these relate to actual real people. The marks on maps are, are real people, and they can inf impact people's lives, and that's certainly our concern. President Biden said when it came to the content of the messages and information, he wasn't concerned. You seem to disagree with that. Well, I can tell you President Zelensky certainly would be concerned, and so would our other allies. Um, whenever we're trusted with information, when we're working in partnership with someone, you know, our in intelligence gathering, our intelligence information, if it is released, can represent a vulnerability to them. Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously it's an issue uh, that's troubling uh, and that, that needs to be addressed. In the, the outcome for the Ukraine conflict, though, it's early enough, and these are static documents, meaning they're pictures of an exact period of time, and uh, mitigation can happen, people can change their strategies, and, and that can change the outcome. I asked this question to Senator Kelly about the concern of Ukraine running through its ammunition stocks too quickly. 
Right. Yeah, so some of these documents would be in the in the form of management documents. When you look at inventories or depleting inventories, uh, they too are static. Uh, what they show is a to-do list and what we need to do and our allies need to do to help Ukraine uh, to replenish uh, those. It doesn't indicate that they have no other sources and that, in fact, they'll, they, they will, uh, will run out and be completely open and vulnerable to Russia. OK, so not necessarily it would be a leap to say Russia will have air dominance yes. on this date because they run out of this thing on the leak itself. Um, the individual who is accused here, Mr. Texera, there's video that's circulated of him saying racist things, shooting guns, anti-Semitic things. He's apparently posted these things on social media and they were there undetected for a long period of time. What part of this needs to change? Because clearly the protocols failed. Right, absolutely. And if you look at the actual complaint and affidavit that was filed when he was arraigned, you, you have the, um, the also admission from the Department of Defense that they are able to track his movements. So clearly he was having access to documents that he should not have had access to. And someone should have been paying attention tapping him on the shoulder and, and ending that access. But in this instance, as you just indicated, you know, through life patterns, there were clearly signals that, that he would, might be a likely uh, leaker of information in the future. And then also the access that he was having to this information uh, should have been cut off. He should have never been having access to this level of, of classified information that could hurt the United States. But he was working basically in tech support. It wasn't necessarily analyzing this information. Right. He Do had no reason. There no, was no need to know for him of the information that he was accessing. And the Department of Defense admits in the affidavit that they had the ability to track him. That's going to be the questions my committee is going right. to be having. So we're going to be having hearings on this. And what we need to do, and from the 9-11 Commission, we learned that we needed to more widely disseminate classified information so that people had actionable intelligence that right. they could piece together puzzles. Clearly, we've gone too far and where we have an instance where someone in Massachusetts who's looking at documents with respect to war plans in Ukraine and the Department of Defense knows. And that's what our committee is going to be looking at is how do we make certain that we make changes? I want to. So to make those changes, I want to ask you to clarify this, um, because there are some conservatives saying things like Tucker Carlson has your colleague Marjorie Taylor Greene in defense of this individual, this 21-year-old man. Um, she called him essentially heroic, white male, Christian, anti-war, an enemy to the Biden regime. She said he told the truth about troops being on the ground in Ukraine and a lot more. Well, first of all, let's be clear. Uh, there are there are no U.S. troops on, on the ground in Ukraine other than the troops that are normally at an embassy protecting right. the embassy. We do not have They're boots not on, on the, the ground. We do not have have uh, have troops on the ground. So it's absolutely in, incorrect assumption from the documents that, that this um, uh, individual leaked. The other aspect is um, he's guilty of, of if he's brought through this process and he's found guilty, it will be of espionage. It's of being a traitor to your country. That's not someone who to, be, to look up to. That is someone who has compromised his country and has certainly compromised uh, our allies. That's not the oath that he took. That's not the job that he took. Right. Um, you are in the Gang of Eight, that small group of lawmakers that gets access to some of the most uh, classified information, including the documents that were found at the residence of President Biden, uh, President Trump, and former Vice President Pence. Have you looked at the documents, and are your questions answered? Right. No, so the Department of Justice has not been forthcoming in this, and they've, they've been somewhat disingenuous, and certainly both the House and the Senate are going to have to address this. One, the documents that were delivered to Congress are not complete, and secondly, they don't identify whose documents they were, whether they came from the trove um, of Biden's behind the uh, Corvette or whether or not they came from Mar Largo. Um, that obviously has that to be addressed. Timing. timing ought to be able to right. tell us, but still at the same time to deliver those documents without even designating whose documents they worked clearly shows, you know, a, a, an unwillingness to be work closely with Congress. Uh, and this also, it's incomplete. I can tell you this, in the reviews that we've had so far of indexes that do include the documents, there's no nuclear codes here. There's no, no one had anything that, that, that uh, was of extreme imminent threat to the United States. Have you seen everything? Or we've the seen the, the index of them. Okay. We've gotten some of the documents delivered to us. Um, but the Department of Justice really needs to, to come clean. They need to deliver the documents to Congress. Uh, they've promised them to us. And they, they need to work with us so that we can get an assessment of what happened here. There are laws that need to be changed so that we can more protect our classified documents yeah. and those who handle them. Uh, and so we, we need them to work with us. The White House gave access to the classified after action report on Afghanistan about a week ago. Have you seen it yet? I have. And? Um, the Well, so the um, I'm... Um, 
I'm very concerned that the Biden administration is looking more for fault uh, blame and blame than really action items as to what we need to do. What, what clearly happened here um, in the abrupt uh, departure from Afghanistan is that a number of mistakes were made. We can only make certain that we don't repeat those mistakes if we're able to, to mm -hmm. really understand them. Congress has put together an Afghan commission uh, that is reviewing our time there and our exit. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a very helpful avenue also of getting understanding of what happened and how do we not do this again. Congressman, uh, it's good to have you here. There's a lot to get through, and uh, we hope to have you back soon. We'll be back in a moment. We're joined now by Christine Lagarde, former head of the IMF, now the president of the European Central Bank. Good morning. Good, good to morning, have you Margaret. here. Lovely to be back. And your recovery is going all right? Yes. In a couple of days, I think I'll be fine. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you have a long list of things ahead of you, and I want to ask you about the global recovery. Mm -hmm. um, you were speaking a few days ago, and you said the recovery for the economy is fragile and uncertain. In this country, the Fed thinks we'll see a mild recession later this year. Mm. What is it that you predict? First of all, there is recovery. That's, I think, a point that was uh, not really firm only six months ago, where we all assumed that there would be a recession, um, if only a technical one. If you look at all the forecasts at the moment, it's all positive. It's been slightly down downgraded, but overall we have a recovery and we are faced with high uncertainty because of multiple factors. You know, f from our corners of the world, it's the war in Ukraine, it's the financial stability uh, that clearly has been shaken up a bit by um, the uh, US and Switzerland developments. It's uh, inflation that we are fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all that which really create a, a, a hollow of uncertainty around a recovery that we want to embed. That's, that's pretty much where we are. So there were those recent bank failures here in the United States, also one in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, given that, it sounds like you're saying you don't see a hard landing. You're seeing a positive trajectory for the global economy. I think we have a narrow path to navigate, which requires that uh, both the governments and uh, the central banks around the world mm -hmm adopt the right policies. Given the bank failures we just saw, you hear from bank CEOs in this country, mm -hmm. uh, this idea that they're getting more cautious about lending money, yeah. lar largely, that there's some contraction in credit there. How concerned are you, and how does that complicate your planning? It's funny you should ask complication, because in a way, it facilitates my planning. And it complicates the future as because far as Because it slows growth. down business activity. Yes. So you don't have to yes. raise rates as much or as frequently. We, we don't have to reduce. We, we'll see. Because we need to really measure mm -hmm. what will come out of this, uh, this financial um, events that took place recently. What impact will it have? How will banks react? How will they assess risk? And how much credit will they lend? Uh, but if they don't lend too much credit, and if they manage their risk, it might reduce the work that we have to do to reduce inflation. Mm -hmm. Okay, But if they reduce too much credit, then it will weigh on growth excessively. There are predictions that the U.S. could default in its national debt as soon as June, some say September. Mm -hmm. And we have a political standoff in this country, virtually no negotiation happening on, on how to resolve this. Does that undermine your confidence in the United States? And, and what message does that send to the world? I have huge confidence in the United States. You know, ever since my year in this country, in this city, in 73, 74, I have had confidence in this country. And I just cannot believe that they would let such a major, major disaster happen of the United States defaulting on its debt. This is not possible. I cannot believe that it would happen. But if it did happen, it would have very, very negative impact not just for this country, where confidence would be challenged, but around the world. Let's face it. This is the largest economy. Uh, it's, it's a major leader in economic growth around the world. It cannot let that happen. I understand the politics. I've been in politics myself. Mm -hmm. But there is a time when the higher interest of a nation has to prevail. I'm sorry. And you think that will happen? The higher I interest. have huge trust in this country, yet again. Um, 
you're bringing a lot of optimism to a show where we don't have a lot of optimism. Oh, Madame I'm sorry. Lagarde. No, I like it. it it's interesting. It's a change. Um, I want to ask you, though, about what you just said in terms of U.S. leadership. Mm -hmm. um, you look to the other side of the globe, and Xi Jinping has said he wants China to be the world's leading power mm -hmm. by 2049. Um, and Beijing is very interlinked into so many economies, particularly in Europe. Um, is the U.S. losing global influence? There is clearly a competition between these, these large economies. What I hope very much is that they can have a dialogue because you know, all these relationships, whether it's trade, whether it's politics, whether it's economic development, whether it is financial stability, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. We cannot ignore each other and trade should not be confrontational. It has to be careful. It has to identify the areas that are strategic for one country or the other or all the others, but it shouldn't be confrontational. I'm on the same page as Henry Kissinger on that or Kevin Rudd, the new Australian ambassador. Conflict is not unavoidable. But there is, it seems, increased political pressure to choose between the United States and China mm. in many ways mm. um, in some of these political capitals. Is that even practical uh, from an economic point of view? It would lead to economic downside, the, the amount of which is uncertain. Is the global economy going to be affected by one or X percent? There are multiple forecasts. All of them are negative. So the decoupling and the sort of bipolarization of the world would lead to less economic growth, less prosperity in the world, more poverty across the world. So I think that this is something that should be by all means avoided. Madame Lagarde, it's always wonderful to have you here. Thank you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.